What's up guys? Just grooving to some music. Channel's not monetized, so I figure why not rock out to the Beatles a little bit. Just waiting for people to fill in. Uh, let me turn off all my alerts so I won't be annoying y'all with noise. Ta-da. Come on in, welcome. All right, so. This is the new tank. And what's up? What is up, Craig? So, now that some people are in here, I'll kill the music. Just listening to music, doing a thing. So, um, but yeah. So, today I want to talk. So, I put out a video yesterday discussing kind of the basics of this scape, but also scapes in general. And I drew on the glass. What's up, James? Welcome, everybody. Uh, and so today I want to cover a couple things. I've got, uh, Tamaj, welcome man, uh, come on in, good to see y'all. So I have some plants laid out on a table that I'm going to be preparing while we can do like a question and A and stuff, but in here right now I'm going to talk to you first about the functionality hidden in this aquascape, and when you're doing an aquascape, these are tips obviously I've picked up from other people, but they've really helped me out and I think they're gonna help my animals out in here in the long run so one thing that I did unintentionally and you know we'll walk over to my other tank real quick just to to show you how it works better hey Patricia welcome um, so I've noticed that if you slope rocks in tanks that then the fish uh, poo or moln and detritus works its way on these slopes with gravity obviously and turbulence in the water works its way down to right around here then this small area that normally would be root bound and insane becomes a whole new bed that's always growing of nutrients so if you can have sloped rocks right to the edge of areas in your tank with your aquascape you can grow really crazy amounts of stuff so in this tank right now I'll try to zoom in on some stuff just so you can kind of see what all is going on in here. But we have a big auction coming up for plants and fish at our club. By the way, I think this is adorable. The Corydoras always hang out on this rock together because it gets warm with the, the lamp. But all five of the Hebrosis are always right there except for feeding time and at night. But this tank has no CO2 very little uh, additional ferts. It is just jam packed full of fish. And uh, there's some root tabs, I must admit. But other than that, there's not a lot going on in that sense. And we do have, these are cribs you're looking at, but basically I wanted to talk about how you can see how much how how tightly stems can grow and they'll actually grow under these rocks as long as you've got large size gravel so that's a great way to get more space out of your tank when you feel like you're at a max kind of and even things like bulbs and things that usually need to be kind of buried under a substrate ideally you can kind of let them be and they'll build up with um uh, mold. So, uh, Steve says, what light is on the tank? So, I've gone over this in the past, but it's worth mentioning again, definitely. These are Cree LEDs, and they're by Canson, which is just some Chinese knockoff. The, the label is all in Russian. They're from eBay, my friend. Got them from, or no, Alibaba, which is like eBay in, or Amazon in, in China. And he got them, he's Bangladeshi, he got them for me. But they are super, super bright. I mean, this is there's daylight coming into the house, and you can see the difference. And they're just 30 watt spots. And halfway through the day on the days that I'm working at home, I move them between this part of the tank and this part of the tank. And that kind of just gets everything so that it has light. But you can see, like, how quickly these have grown in maybe three days the hornwort that I buried down below finally got some light and decided to come out also um, I had some I have some plants in here that are growing these beauties right here 
and I cannot pronounce the name, and I'm sorry, but they are an Afghan plant that is not for sale anywhere commercially, but somebody brought back them from Afghanistan, and they grow in pa- Pakistan and Afghanistan in the water and marshes on the border and in the mountains, and they're really growing well, and I'm really excited because they have kind of this cool uh, spade, waxy, like, jade plant look to them. So I kind of look to this tank as my inspiration for my other tanks because none of my tanks do as well as this tank. This tank is just, it's got something magic going on. I can grow Rotala Wallichia with with no problem. The Siamese algae eaters keep it clean. I've got um, Pogo Stem and Erectus. I've got uh, Aromatica in here. Down the wormhole, welcome. I'm trying out this new time slot just to see how people like this time on Sundays rather than later in the afternoon. This was my other aquascape that was intentional. And right now, this is really cool and I wanted to show y'all. So basically, I was told with these tricolor lilies that if you cut a lily pad and planted it, nothing would happen, that it would rot and die. And same with the stem and the roots. Well, this lily pad I planted in the corner. And three weeks later, it has grown its own set of now four leaves out of it. And it's starting to build a bulb. Right, here we go, in focus. Right up in here, there's a hard nodule that's building into a bulb. And it's put out roots. So, I have not found any literature that speaks to this with the tricolor red lily, but I'm hoping to propagate it so that maybe I can share it with more folks because it, this is a rare morph and it's hard to find. The tricolor lily you'll see other places on top that looks like this, but really the magic is this underside. So this underside, when you look at it in just the right, like a normal light, you don't see anything, but just the right light and it's bright purple. And it's really beautiful. It's also deep crimson with the new growth. And uh, then it has kind of this psychedelic, swirly, splattered pattern on it on the underside. So I really like that plant. And I'm going to let this suck the nutrients out of this existing leaf a little more. And then I'll probably just bury the leaf with it and uh, see what happens. Uh, Lemna Minor does the same thing. It's good to know. I don't know a lot about lilies, um, so it's cool to know. This tank has gotten overgrown, but as I said, we have a big plant sale coming up, and so I want to trim back everything just before the 21st. And so some of these things that normally I would have cut that long ago, um, I want, I just let it go. And this is a low tank, a low tech tank right now. This is a new Buse. Uh, cutting that I got a week or two ago and it has blue and bronze. It's just a beautiful uh, plant. Different lights give it different colors. This is a T5 light right now, like fluorescent type thing. And I don't particularly like this light in that all this diatome red algae has started growing. But before I was getting black algae and so like black beard and so I'd rather have this and actually you can kind of see like with the green mixed in you can kind of see the tech sorry the tanks dirty you can kind of see the texture of the rocks better and the blue shrimp really pop on it so I'll let it take over rather than black beard algae any day so then also these endlers I just wanted to give you guys an update on them so those are the two sires or kings I guess of the colony. This female shrimp just gave birth. Whoop, coming through the current. Now, these don't like current, so I should get it out of the current, but I'll deal with that later when I'm not busy with y'all. But some of the young endlers are starting to finally color up. Their tails are just now, I'm seeing if they're turning into spade tails or not. And uh, yeah, so things are going good there. I moved a big gang of them downstairs. The other stuff we have going on that I was going to talk about other than the aquascaping stuff, I have a bunch of plants here. And so I was just going to kind of go through some of these plants. These are all tissue cultures and discuss them. 
I scared my wife. She thought I'd started using heroin or something. It is a big problem here, well, everywhere, but in Seattle particularly. You know, Jimi Hendrix, Kurt Cobain, all that. It's got a long history. But this has no needle on it. It's just uh, a syringe that I use um, to spot treat different types of algae with hydrogen peroxide. So I'll use like a couple cc's of hydrogen peroxide and put it right into the the algae. So that's what that's for. Uh, but my wife was like, what is going on when she saw that and a razor blade on the table? And I'm like, oh, the razor's for cleaning the tank, I swear, honey. Uh, but I've gone through some of these. Some of these tissue cultures, I don't want to say where, but I was dumpster diving. Some of these I bought at Aquarium Zen, who has sponsored that main tank. Um, and I just heard a weird hissing noise, which is interesting. I think it was one of the fish at the surface. I haven't heard him do that before. Um, but yeah, so we've got peacock moss here. We've got, um, this Ricardia. It, what it is, is it's a small, a miniature Pelia, and it has no roots. So my plan is to take, uh, if you recall in past videos, I had chips from the aquascape over yonder and the chips are so sharp I can literally shave my arm hair with them they're like obsidian arrowhead you know flint arrowhead uh, sharp and I've cut myself with them several times as well when I broke off a piece I actually cut myself pretty decently last week with them um, but in any case plan is to glue with super glue just any cyanoacrylate uh, brand super glue and then I asked my dentist for some old dental tools and these are great so you don't get super glue all over your fingertips so that's just a functional thing but I've got these real thin slices that clearly they're not gonna float they're stone it's dense stone uh, but what I plan on doing is taking some of the moss and the uh, Pelia and some other Java moss I already have and gluing that to these chips and then burying them under the substrate because I don't want to go out and buy the very fine uh, ADA style substrate. And then another thing that I have going on that may turn into a video later is I saved all of the gelatin looking stuff from the last batch of these plants that came from ADA. So I bought, now three times this week I've bought batches of plants. So I've got everything from uh, little penny warts to, um, this is actually a type of milfoil I found out, but it's miniature, and it's uh, Myriophilium uh, Guiana. So it's a, from uh, French Guiana, uh, and it's ADA. And that name, it just sounds so like, Oh, wow, and it's ten ninety nine. It must be some high-end thing. Well, I could have just gone to the local lake and probably ripped out some milfoil, but <clears throat> c'est la vie. No, uh, no bacteria, nothing like that. So what I was saying, though, is this stuff is going to make up the carpet of my tank. I thought about doing dwarf baby tears, but I just hear so many people having problems with them that whatever. The other thing that I wanted to discuss... Oh, People are talking. I'm sorry. I, I missed all of the talking. Um, welcome, Cherry Hayes. Welcome, everybody in here. Let me know if you like this time or if you have questions. That's I'm here to a answer those. Like I usually have a theme, and it's just kind of a rough theme. Side note, Dr. Pepper must have, like, their truck must have not come in, and so now I ha ha all I have is Pib Extra. So life's pretty hard right now. But this stuff, so I saved it. I looked up online what is in the, uh, the agar or auger that um, if Betsy's on here, she's going to say it's agar, and she's right. Tilapia store, welcome. Uh, but it's, it's the gelatiny stuff at the bottom of tissue culture cups, and it's dark in plants where there's not a root structure that's easy to see. And then when the root structure is... A little easier to see let's try to find an example like there where it's dark it's when there's bright roots and things so that they stand out better and then uh, it'll be light in other cases but that's just a coloration thing like here here it's clear and I wanted to say so this stuff right here is uh, Ludwigia arcuata and I do use some root tabs sometimes 
I'll go into that in a minute. But what I wanted to say is I don't want to encourage y'all to break the law, but check out the laws in your state. And if you're willing to, it's totally worth taking a look behind aquarium shops and Petco and things like that and looking for dumps like dumpster diving because usually it's just in a box it's not bad and like this was something I won't say what city I was in because I haven't looked up their regulations to be quite frank but in some places once trash is out in the trash it is no longer their property in other places it is then the city's property but I managed to score some great stuff this week by just walking around back on I hadn't done that since college, but I just was like, oh, why not? I'm not eating this or anything. Let's let's see what they've got. And just because of that yellowing and, I don't know, the expiration date, it got thrown out. And it's it was listed at, like, I don't know, 12 bucks or something. So I've acquired some good stuff that way this week. And also, some things were discounted at Aqua Zen, or Aquarium Zen, which is my favorite little ADA store. Uh, this was discounted because everything was misturned colors. But back to what I was saying. This stuff, I blended it up, got everything out that was biological that I could see in it, and it is apparently a mix of HCG, which is like a growth hormone, and and as well as agar or auger and water, and then uh, cellulose, pure cellulose, and then it has uh, ammonia, nitrogen, and uh, potassium, zinc, and magnesium in it, as well as one more plant uh, hormone that I can't recall. But I'm going to try putting some starts into this and putting saran wrap over it and sealing it with CO2 uh from my uh, my CO2 uh, tank over there and see what happens. And maybe that'll be a video. If it works out, I mean, maybe we can kind of culture. It's not quite the same as grafting but uh, or, or doing a true cellular culture on that level. But I don't know. It might be something worthwhile to save your, your things and kind of dry start your own tank. So if we look over here, this is a new addition. I bought this online. I'll have to do a review on this thing. But it is a CO2 tank um, that's apparently turned off right now. Sorry, hold on. Let me set you guys up while I monkey with this. Do, 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 do. Okay. So it's real touchy. And righty tidy lefty loosey does not hold true on this thing. <laughs> so whatever. But it seems to work pretty well. Uh, it, it took some uh, trying to figure it out. And the bubble size is so small that it's not really like a, a bubble. So you kind of have to do two bubbles a second. Plus, I left the line fairly long on on the all this extra line hanging down. And it's heavy-duty uh, CO2 line that can hold like 200 PSI, which is a good thing to have uh, so it doesn't blow up on you like I've had air hose line blow up on me and scare the bejesus out of me. Uh, so, CO2 for the tank. Why do you need CO2 for a tank? And hello, bending unit 13. Um, so, the reason you need CO2, you don't need it. Uh, if if you weren't here earlier, let me. Uh, I'll show you real quick. This tank doesn't have CO2. And to answer the root tab question, this, this is loose gravel of various sizes, which is important. Because otherwise you'll get bacteria and detritus or poop from the fish that builds up down low. And it ends up building up. And if it cuts itself off or if you have sand too thick or whatever, too much of the same substrate that no flow, anaerobic or bad juju bacteria uh, grows and it can kill your fish if, if it gets disrupted. If you plant something, if you pull a plant out, if the fish dig through it, and fish do dig. So... Um, I have very little substrate in this tank, and basically, I just feed these guys quite a bit. Bad juju, yes. Um, and I just have let it kind of do its thing, and this tank, like I said, is my... I've lucked out. This is not how a tank usually goes. 
but I monitor just the nitrates. I'll check on the ammonia every so often on this tank, but it's a 40 gallon tall. And I, I used to think that that was awful. Now I really like it because that whole water column it actually keeps the, the detritus pretty dense. And I will gravel vac in between plants a little bit, but for the most part, I just let it be and it's just well cycled now and I'll cycle wood in and out of it too, which seems to help for some reason or another. This was a crazy find in a dumpster. Uh, this is a ginormous uh, Rotala rotundifolia that was grown out of water. So that's what it would have looked like if it was, uh, I, I think that's what it was, yeah. But it had like normal looking stuff at the bottom and I just thought, eh, I'll throw it in the tank and see if it can be saved, uh, turned back into water form. Whereas normally you'll, you'd see something more like this. Um, as I've said before, I still am going to do a series on immersed plants versus non-immersed plants. So that tank doesn't have CO2 and it's doing well. So plants grow several ways. The first way is through photosynthesis. We, we all probably know about that, but you've got your um, photosynthetic cells. Usually that's through chlorophyll and you see that as green. Same with algae, some algae. And because of that, the in the daytime, the light causes the cells to trap that energy and it can convert photon light into energy and warmth into energy. Then at nighttime and during that time, they're breathing in CO2. So in the water, fish breathe out CO2. In our, in our air, our air that we breathe is about 60, 50 to 60 percent nitrogen and then 30 percent air or, or oxygen, I'm sorry, and maybe 10 percent carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide or carbon, you know, just different carbon con constituents of carbon compounds. Monoxide is harmful in large amounts, so that's not usually what's present. Indoors sometimes, but next to a car, yes. Uh, but in a tank like this that's new, it can either get its carbon from fish poop, which, you know, most life form on Earth, all life on Earth is carbon-based, or it can get its energy from the sun, which is there some of the time, and these lights will never, as, as good as you want them, they will never replicate the full bandwidth, so to speak, the whole uh, amount of the sun. So what happens is we use CO2 in the hobby, like back there, and that's part of this structural aquascaping that I was going to discuss is I'm still, this is a quote unquote high tech tank in that it's nutrient rich substrate. This is ADA light. So it has ammonia and nitrates in it and nitrites in it, as well as magnesium and other things like that, that plants crave. If anybody gets that reference. Uh, so but I'm using a hang off the back. I don't have a glass horn and I don't have a um, I'm sorry, what are they called? Uh, like a wave maker or um, I'm trying to think of the proper word, power head in here. So I use a, a CO2 tank here and that creates gas. Now the gas then dissipates into the water. The, the, the finer the bubbles, the better. And then that filter up here is pushing those little bubbles all around the tank. And you can see them if you look really closely. But when they get trapped up under the plants and on the plants, they actually use that carbon instead of the waste carbon, and they suck up that nutrients. Now, when you're starting a high-tech tank like this, where you're using CO2, you're using fertilizers, um, for me, I have... Uh, Yohojo, thank you, man. Um, so I'm using this because it's from a local shop, and uh, this is the other shop fairly close to me, like half hour away, but easy green. So it's, it's, let's see if we can read on the, on the label. It's got, uh, nitrogen, potassium, phosphate, uh, magnesium and other trace elements. But basically you can see it crystallizes on there and that's, that's what these plants are eating in the water. That's what they need for nerve conductivity. 
Some plants open and close at night and things like that, and they use potassium, just like we do. All of our nerve functions are potassium ion channels and salt, so plants need those same things, even if it's in trace amounts. In the wild, they get it leached from rocks and from fish and from uh, poop and things like that, uh, but in a tank, you need to introduce that if you want it to work uh, well. So... That's what I'm doing here. And this tank, all that stuff that I showed you over on the table, I think the plan is we, we've got a, we've got some test uh, stuff going on here to see how it works out. But I think what we're going to do, and if you look at this tank, we've got a whole back row here that we can plant on. And I need to probably get a little power head up in the corner or over in this corner so that every so that the water moves better because having this kind of wall is causing the water to not move as well. Like this plant is not going to get is enough enough nutrients and you can already tell it's not liking it. So basically you're covering your bases. Like these plants here, I've got different um you know, there's java fern starts that I kind of put in here. There's java moss. So some of these plants use rhizomes and they fix their energy out of the water itself. And that's where CO2 can be really helpful. And then others use their roots and then some do both. So there's several ways that plants work. And that's, that's the most common is that they use their roots <clears throat> and then they use their leaves for respiration and at night they put out oxygen and in the day they put out um, or they suck in co2 and put out oxygen all day at night they put out oxygen and co2 and kind of cleanse the gas from their veins so to speak and then so they they grow one way at night and by using co2 you can kind of trick them at night it's like they were on steroids all day and then they grow at night with the carbon in their system. They use it as a, 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 think of it as like a warehouse full of building blocks and they use that and they have them all ready to stack up like Legos and at night, that's the stacking occurs at night. And that's lilies and things open and close at night and that's all done by capillary action of water filling up things or by carbon actually entering and causing things to swell to open and then in the in the morning, it goes back down towards the warehouse and the stem and in the, the roots oftentimes. So same thing if you cut a plant, it has potassium signals and it will start dripping oftentimes like sap and things like that or poppies. If you've seen how people collect opium, they score it and it starts dripping. Same with like if you tap a maple tree or something like that. All that uh, is signals that the plants have. Um, I suppose the stream answers my email. Hey, Bentley. Uh, yeah, I didn't see your email yet. And I just got back from the airport. I dropped my wife off. And uh, dropped my wife off. I'll answer another question. So I have, well, I have Oreo on my mouth. But I have really bad uh, allergies and like lupus swelling right now. And this whole cheek is just, um, oh, I'm sorry, Bentley, man, I should have informed you better. But yeah, I look like a friggin' train wreck and I've got, my wife put foundation on cause she's like, you're going to get in trouble at the airport or something. But like, you can see the normal skin color there at my scalp and I've just got just, eh, you don't want to look at me. So, uh, that's just life. Um, so yeah. Um, but down here, the other thing that happened, I eat organic food. I mean, I eat Oreos and <laughs> Mr. Pib are my vice because I don't drink alcohol anymore. And, uh, I know sugar's not good for inflammation, but it is my weakness. Um, so this was dropped off this morning. I got it for 50 bucks and it's full. No, the fish room does not have a name yet. And... Uh, we need to name it, and I want you folks' help. You can comment afterwards. People were commenting before, and there's some really good ones on there, and I'm still open. I'm going to leave it open for like a week or something, and whoever's got the best one will we'll go ahead and do. The other score I wanted to show you from a dumpster diving find was 
basically this stuff. So it was getting tossed out at aquarium's end. Oh, the heater's kind of low on that. Every so often, things are just get off. So the uh, this is definitely grown outgrown its roots uh, or its its pot, but I planted some of it. Uh, tissue culture version of it uh, about a week ago so I know it grows well and I know those tops look identical and it being a stem plant we can take this and we can put it up in the the high-tech tank we'll just get rid of all of that and those roots yeah normally you don't want to cut off the roots of a plant like that but what are you gonna do so I have a brief tragedy to tell you about and she's right here. I'm going to do an autopsy tonight. Second set of cribs. Instant death. They're still full of color. They're just dead. Water parameters, all perfect. There's some sort of virus in these two older tanks. And I even mentioned, boy, I sure need to change that substrate because I don't want, when I was going back and forth between these tanks when I had the cribs in the first place, I was like, there's too much uh, substrate that's compact here. There could be bacteria, and of course cribs take things and they siphon it out with their mouth and they move it around. Like this, this black gravel is from over here. And... I'm really, really bummed because I, I really, really try to treat them well. And I've got like a sponge filter and a power head and an airline. And I mean, like it's, I tried lots of different things. The ones that seem to be doing the best, um, are, are all the non wild ones. The all, every wild crib that I've had now has passed away within a month of me having it. Even though these last ones laid eggs. Uh, but they they just passed away and I they look great color wise they just turn into a zombie and then no those eggs the mother ate them uh, which was really frustrating uh, she got nervous or didn't feel like it was right I guess and she ate them so I'm adding this to my tray of projects to work on later but basically we'll be cutting away all of this. Oh, wow. Yes, I would love some Bapindis, Bentley. Um, and I re really love to come by. I'm just dragging today. But I promised myself that I was going to do a video every day for 100 days. And I'm trying not to break that streak. Even though I've been laying. Um, yeah, but I can't catch a break with the cribs. So... Um, the ones that I got, I got some from a friend, uh, Showman, and his were born in captivity, and they're fine. And I also had another one, just an oddball, that somebody wanted me to take care of because their other one had died. And it was born in captivity. It was fine. But the two wild, the Nigerian Red and the Lukunja, have mysteriously gotten sick, basically become zombies that are non-responsive, and then died and literally this time it was last night she was not responsive and by two in the morning i was talking to betsy take it easy man um and i was talking to betsy on chat and i she she asked me something i went and checked on them and they were dead um i thought did it get gassed or something and i was like no there's no co2 i, I have no idea what happened um they were acting slightly sluggish but I mean, yeah, so it, it was actually kind of uh, emotional. I don't know. If, uh, I think I need to redo. I need to gut and redo that tank down there, too. There there could be it's it has ADA aqua soil in it. Um, when I got the cribs from Showman, he's got some tanks that he moved and he had to kind of like let them get into funky shape. Uh, or they just did because he has 16 tanks. And I took some of his active substrate like from the bottom thinking, oh, cool, it won't have ammonia. Uh, that way I can do some more active substrate planting and get better results. Put that into existing tanks and all the other fish are fine. But those cribs that go through substrate, I'm almost positive there's something in there like a virus or a bacteria 
that is just no good. But I thought it would have been okay in that tank that they were in that I just showed you. But they're, uh, n they're not, obviously. So let's get into some philosophy of, of stuff. I talked about this in a video last night a bit. But I want to talk to you more about this specific scape and not scaping in general. Um, but you can apply it to other scapes and just decorating. You don't have to go crazy with decorating. But uh, just some of the things that being an artist and taking geometry and geology and some of these other practices have taught me about uh, these tanks in general. So let me turn on, I'm going to turn on the red light on here. Roxanne! You don't have to turn on that red light. Um, love the rocks. What type is it? So the rocks, I'm glad you dig them. They are for sale. I just have to give the, the pitch because we've kind of buddied up and partnered up. They are for sale at Aquarium Zen if you happen to live in the Northwest. If you don't, then uh, I have them. And I'm actually talking. Betsy wanted some. Who, she's always on the chats. I don't know where she is today. But... Uh, she wants some, and so I think we're going to try shipping a flat rate box, and I'll, what I can do, if you would like, is I can put some together and play around and see what type of formation for a 10 or 20 gallon tank I can make, and then I can put it in one of those large flat rate boxes for like 15 bucks or whatever, and we can figure out a price, but basically I quarried this up in the Cascades, and it this this version this camera does not do it justice but it has beautiful uh subtle green tones and purple tones um and it has like here this is actually kind of a like a soft grayish green here it's like a periwinkle purple gray and then back up in here let's take this light off of it for a moment there's actual the jade, where the term jadeite comes from. There's the low-grade jade. So it's not the same as the clear Chinese jade that you see. It's actually a jadeite, and it would need to be under pressure and heat for another few million years. But you can carve this stuff. It has the properties of jade, and uh, it, it's kind of cool. I've carved a couple things out of it. Um, maybe I'll share those with you guys sometime. Some of it, though, is more of just a crystalline, microcrystalline uh, uh, quartzite kind of thing, but it has beautiful banding in it and things. Mad Fish Diva, welcome, welcome. Um, so what I wanted to show you, though, is there's rocks all over the place that you may, like, not look twice at. But So this, it has kind of, like, a grayish, like, there's a slight green hue to it, but... Once I put it underwater, you can see, oh, there's like a spot where iron deposits are showing. There's this big old band of smoother stone. Um, and then there's actually some sort of metallic deposit in the corner, like whether that's fool's gold or whatever. But play with stones or go out on a rainy day if you're going to collect. This stuff is super hard. It's like an 8.5 on the Mohs uh, gem and geo geological scale. And so cracking it is really hard. I have to find a fault line and then I have to take a pickaxe and a sledgehammer and a chisel and just kind of work that fault line until pieces come off. And as I was saying, I was trying to turn some into gravel. So for this aquascape, I could put some kind of gravel in there. And basically when I hit it, flakes break off that are sharp and they will slice right through you and you don't even feel it it just cuts you and you're wet before you're in pain it's just your warm blood you feel before you feel pain it's bizarre um it's like obsidian so uh, we just got a drone given to us cool uh, you could probably look for some rocks that way uh, and Patricia, you say ouch, but so I used to, when I did my archaeology degree, I did flint napping just to learn how to make hand tools like the ancient way. And I cut myself with obsidian and I did it a lot of times before I figured out what I was doing and got the proper, uh, hides and antlers and things to strike with. But 
it's so sharp that usually it cuts you through it cuts through the nerve too and so it's so quick so sharp that you don't feel it like you feel it healing up and when the nerves regrow but i've had it cut me all the way down to the bone on like fingers knuckles and stuff and not known that that has happened because it's just it's odd it's very odd it's so sharp they've done heart surgery with it and they still do eye surgery with obsidian um because they can't get a sharper blade on metals it's actually they can get it down to two atoms of or two molecules sorry not atoms of the substance as the blade edge whereas like the sharpest scalpels i think are maybe like 12 molecules or something i mean it's absurd plus the bond is strong because it's forged by volcanoes and pressure and yada yada so i was going to talk a little bit about this scape I don't know if any of you are on the computer right now, but if you are, I highly encourage you to, if you can keep this window open, Google uh, the Sistine Chapel and Adam and God or the creation of man or something like that. But that was the idea. Oh, cool, man. Lil Fire. That's rad, dude. Uh, but the idea here was to have a broken arch and as I started playing with it, I was like, man, this kind of reminds me of the Sistine Chapel. Like, the hand stretched out and then God's hand touching. And so as I noticed that, I was like, that's going to be the theme. Like, not that I'm religious or anything. And I went there once, and it was just like this hurried, frantic, don't take any pictures, like no room to move. Kind of like not as cool as the Discovery Channel special on it, unfortunately. Like some places you go to and you're like, wow, that is amazing. And other places you're like, that was claustrophobic and I could barely see what they were talking about. I feel like Mount Rushmore is kind of lame too that way, but that's just me. Uh, where do you get your stuff for your scape? So that's what I was just saying. I get it up in the Cascade Mountains. If you look up my area, it's in the kind of north to central Cascades of Washington. It's east of Everett, the city Everett, Washington, east of Seattle and north of there, northeast of Seattle. And it's not quite up to like the mountain peak level, but it's about 2,000 feet up or 1,500 feet up. And uh, that pass goes up to... Oh, that's Stevens Pass. I think it goes up to 4,000 feet or so. And the mountaintops go up to 7,000 around there. So you can find some really cool stuff, but the farther up you go, you get back into fossilized um, stone that has, like, calcite and carbon and stuff in it. And it's cool shells and shapes, but it's going to make your water, uh, it's going to raise your pH a whole bunch. So which is fine for certain things. Like you could do a guppy tank with that probably if you did enough water changes. But I wanted to talk a little bit about, so like perspective. Oops, sorry. This was a trick I did the other night and I just kind of did it on accident. So when you do a tank, so I'm gonna level all this out. Now I'm gonna put carpeting stuff in here today. We're gonna glue it onto stones. I wanted to get some mesh, but we're gonna glue it onto stones and we're gonna also put moss in between all the cracks. I see, I just joined when you were talking about how sharp obsidian is. I think it'd be cool to have some fossils in a tank. Yeah, I can show you some fossils in a sec too that I've tried in tanks, but they also add to the hardness. Usually if a stone holds a fossil, uh, around here anyways, our fossils are from pretty brittle uh, silt stones, uh, sandstones, limestones, things like that. Uh, but this banding is both a blessing and a curse. If you have rock where you can see how it was laid down so here you can see this rock was laid down over time and you can see when conditions changed and so that can be awesome in that it can tell the story of your tank so this tank i filled with 15 times i kid you not i've had insomnia and i've been feeling awful but for some reason i've been pushing myself to work on this tank and the idea is in the back here, I'm going to use very, very small leafed plants and I'm going to have an entire curtain across the back. And then in these corners, we'll have as a frame, like curtains on a stage, some taller plants and some fluffy plants. Um, and then in between, I need to get a couple more bigger plants, like some 
uh, boost. I think a good boost would fit right in there. Or something that looks like a little tree, maybe. A Kabamba might be... Uh, purple Kabamba could be an option. Or... Um, something that I keep really highlight on that stays real stunted. But what I was talking about, so this, the the deposition lines of the way it was deposited, it tells you a story over time, over millions of years, how these things formed and that the pressure was pushing down on it like that. So then when you make your scape, if that's sideways, if, if this rock was oriented the other way, it doesn't make any sense as far as, like, we know that subconsciously. Even if you haven't learned that, you look at it and you're like, why are the stripes going that way? And it looks off. Now, also another little thing is at mountain peaks, you tend to get the oldest part of rocks, especially during continental uplift. And so here I've used the forms that look the most like what's called breccia, which has larger crystals and things because it's it's been in under the mountain and then it's been pushed all the way up and then it starts to fall and crumble and get aged and weathered. So I tried to use the rougher, more jaggedy pieces towards the top. And same with here, like you can see where it's broken. And I actually chiseled away at some stuff. And this stone... This is all balanced, so there's nothing holding this together other than gravity, and hence the funkiness here. This would never happen in nature. I like the line here and here and here, but this piece, and then there's another piece under it for support, that would not happen in nature. Like, where did it even come from? Unless there's a giant cliff up here that perfectly drops slabs that don't break, um, that wouldn't happen. And so... When you do scapes, if you're trying to keep it realistic like that, we want to hide our sins, so to speak. And so putting plants in those places, if, if you cover up that junction like or another stone, I just don't want to put more stone. There's already a lot of stone in this tank. You then get a different feel for the tank than if, you see, oh, all points are leading to there. That be that cave becomes a focal point. But since it is there, I wanted to use it. And so when I saw that there was going to be a void if I balanced the rock there, and same over here, I created in that void, which is probably about three or four square inches, uh, I put all sorts of little pebbles in there, and then I stuffed some moss at the entrance. And the idea is that the shrimp that will go in here will use that as a nursery. It's like a rock pile cave, basically. Now, back to the banding on this. This banding, I have a story, so it starts making sense. The banding's at this angle, goes up, up, up. You can see more banding here. And then all of a sudden, it reaches too high and collapses. And you see the banding then goes like this. And this piece is fortunately enough bands at an angle Let's see here. Can you see it? Yeah, there's the band. So it bands at this cool angle. And I was going to have these pieces so close that they were barely touching and then have crumbled, collapsed rock right here, which would have been fine too. But instead, I looked at this Sistine Chapel and I looked at the hand, which has a thumb here and fingers open and it's curved and limp kind of like this. And it's reaching out, and then there's God with his deities and everything reaching to Adam with a, a more direct arm and finger, and, and uh, Adam is slumped back, leaning this way. So take a look at the Sistine Chapel. I should have overlaid a picture over this. Uh, I kind of played with it on, on my computer, and then I like it just looked so odd. Nobody would have known what I was doing. But uh, because of that, I like to find inspiration in... Uh, copying you know i copy nature i copy great masterworks that are already resonate within our heads this is a little uh, nerdy thing that i did so there's a band here and it wraps around the rock diagonally then this this band on this rock wraps around diagonally too so it wraps around here and it could connect to the band on this rock and then it could make a figure eight essentially the way it's stacked and in art and geometry and math there's a, a thing called the Mobius loop, 
which is a never ending loop where the inside becomes the outside becomes the inside becomes the outside. It looks like the infinity symbol. Uh, and you can make it at home. If you look up M O B I U S loop out of paper, you can make one, you cut out a strip of paper and you twist it once. Like you have the, the piece of paper, you twist it in the middle once, and then you tape the ends together. And if you follow that edge, the inside becomes the outside of the edge forever it's it's a weird quirk of math and geometry so i like that and i wanted to include it because i was using uh ratios which are let me grab a pen that are long established ancient ancient ratios that have been used from the middle east out through all of time so when you're working on a tank unless you're doing a nature style tank you got a couple kinds of tanks so You've got Iwagumi, which is a rock tank. It is kind of, think of that as the haiku of tanks. The rocks are the focus. That's what that other tank back in the beginning of the cast is. Is totally an Iwagumi tank. But you have your high point rock. And this one, it's not clear enough. So it's not doing a good job of being an Iwagumi tank. This rock, if it were yay higher, it'd be perfect. But you have your highest point, and then your next highest point, and then your third point, and they all share a relation. Usually it's, uh, there, you take one measurement, and then the next difference will be three times that, or five times that. And then, so you go tallest, second tallest, then third tallest drops down quite a bit usually. And then from there, third tallest usually has other rocks at a similar height, so one two, three, all kind of tied in there, like what's, like these two, if one were more prominent, it would be a proper Iwagumi tank. But that's just kind of a Japanese aesthetic and practice that's an old one that's kind of cool. Um, this tank, it's sloped back, so here you can see I've got, I don't know, It'll once I plane it out, it'll probably be an inch and a half of substrate. In the back, I've got a good five inches of substrate and I know that plays tricks with you with the camera but I'm going to put the slope let me match it with the same height let's see here of the thing and then put the other end okay so if I hold that that's the angle that's actually going on there um, but it it tricks your eyes with depth perception into looking past things and in this I want this to be a window and so the Shire fish can hang out back there. And it's good to have kind of these windows and, and layers to your scapes. That's always going to give you more depth. The standard trick that everyone will recommend is to put big slabs of stone in the front and wherever you want your eye to be caught, um, be, be focused. And you don't usually want it in the middle unless you're doing a... Um, like island type scape where you've got one island with rocks and things coming out. Um, let's see here. So the first rule we're going to discuss is the rule of thirds. That's not straight, but you get the idea. So the rule of thirds, I, I talked about this a little bit. I'm only going to talk about it a little bit again, but you want to look at your, whatever it is, this is from photography and other art, but you want to look at it and look at it from the angle that the the person viewing will see it from. So let's stand up for a sec. Okay. So you want it balanced. And balanced doesn't mean that there's rocks here, there's rocks there. It can. But it can be emptiness too. Emptiness is a form of balance. You can have totally empty and totally light. And you can get more into the, the rule of thirds. Go online, look it up. I might do a video all about it, but it gets in depth if you want to get into it. But for me, what it really means is I like an apex or some activity going on here, 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 and here. So for this, it's maybe a flow. And then this is going to change depending on your angle. So you want it ideally to line up with like here's the bottom of the path and the arch and then over here we've got the tall point and here we've got the segment. If I had drawn that straight it actually would be lower. Um, and then from this angle we kind of get, let's see, right here you get a similar thing going on where you get the beginning of this 
angle here, beginning of this angle back up, this peak, this peak, and your eye gets drawn in here. So the rule of thirds just says that in here, in here, and here, and then also this way, that there's three corridors and that your eye wants to have balance or interest at the intersection of those corridors, ideally. And that's just uh, architecturally, we do that. Um, it's, it's an old trick. And what that derives from is my favorite thing. And there's all sorts of uh, what I will call woo-woo, as Dustin from Dustin's Fish Tanks says, uh, or New Age and hippy dippy stuff. I'm a hippie, but um, so you you look at the the space, and you're gonna do a spiral. And now let's see. So I should start it in the center. Okay. So you do this spiral, and it's gonna be an exponential spiral like a nautilus. So it starts tight and quickly spirals large. And your distance between this point and this point are key. And actually, this should come out farther. And this should be about three times longer here. And then this point to this point should be like four times. But then this point to this point should be like 12 times. So these ratios, and then naturally... Uh, this is all the way back to Mesopotamian and Egyptian times, but the Greeks are the ones who perfected this. They draw lines at the apex to the right, to the left, and uh, to the top and bottom of these things. And they use this grid as a way of determining things. And then where their spiral is, that's where your eye wants to go. So the center of that arch. And then by weight this spiral should touch everything that is of interest. So standing up straight, and you, I drew that spiral a little bit bigger, but ideally you have something weighted in all of that, and it touches to there. So you're not going to have a big void someplace, or if you do have the void, that is... Uh, of interest. So then beyond that, you take these ratios and there's, I mean, there's literally thousands of volumes of, of philosophical writing on this subject, but you take these different ratios of distance. And I actually, when I first set this tank up, I did it properly with a piece of string and a calculator and I figured it all out. Um, and I drew that on there just as a guide. But those ratios, so say it was this far, that should then apply to uh, anything that is a mirror image of itself, or a, a, sorry, a smaller image of itself, a fractalized image. So if this is a jagged shoot, then this size here, the, the wideness at the base, should apply somewhere to another jagged shoot. So that same distance here, or whether it's here in this piece and here, over here, it can apply to the same base. Um, here, same base. But in in nature, the, the Greeks and the Romans really took this to an extreme. And in nature, later on the Renaissance, which the Sistine Chapel is totally laid out with the golden ratio, the golden spiral, whatever you want to call it, um, as well as something called the Fibonacci sequence. And all this is in last night's video too, but I wanted to touch on it again while we're here. So the Fibonacci sequence basically is a, a compact way of putting um, things into a space naturally. So I'm going to try to find something in the house that has that. So uh, fractals are a natural occurring pattern that we use in art. And that is things like, um, let me try to think uh, of, or try to find a good example right now. Um, and I'm trying to find a Fibonacci too. So basically on a tree, you've got a branch and then that pattern is smaller and you've got another branch and then another branch and then another branch. And that, even though if it's not the same ratio or whatever, 
you're it's a it's a fractal in the sense that it mirrors the same idea the same concept and line and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and that to us looks more natural uh, fractals and then to take a few random elements out of that that imperfection also draws our eye in so now I'm looking oh here we go so up here this is perfect this is the golden ratio right here on these shells so this one not so much it's a tighter spiral which has other applications but this one's a great example of an exponential spiral so that would be what I was drawing on the tank and then the distances between the rings in the spiral is what you would be looking at up here is another come on another version of it uh, so it's around in nature a lot and when you work with those things, ideas and concepts like that in your aquascape, it works out great. In classic art like Muka, um, he uses all sorts of things like that to figure out how he's going to space out stuff in his posters, French uh, artists. <clears throat> as well as all the Renaissance artists were obsessed with it to a, like a cult-like point. But I'm trying to find something with a Fibonacci sequence, which is basically like you have a pine cone and it's made up of little diamond shapes. And inside that pine cone shape, it packs diamonds that get smaller and smaller and smaller when you look at them uh, from the top or a sunflower. And it has patterns within patterns that can go both ways. But when you look at a sunflower seed, it kind of radiates out like this. And it's the most effective way to pack in energy into a space and so those are little things that nature or god or what however you want to say it the universe has worked out and is all around us and once you start understanding some of these fundamentals you'll see the difference between human perfection or beauty which is things like the rule of thirds stuff like that and ratios and the difference between fractals and Fibonacci sequences and things like that, which are more um, nature's laws. Now, they're not mathematically predictable per se, but mountain ranges are another good uh, it, uh, example of that. You know, you've got a one big peak, and then you've got a peak within that peak, and then you've got maybe a hill within that, and then you've got a boulder within that, and all the way down sometimes even down to the like molecular level you've got structures that are that same shape and size in in the natural world so those are all just kind of fun funky things about uh art math and geometry so now i was just going to say that the plan today is to plant this tank to hide the sins of imperfection here or or of too much humanity i should say and get some moss growing in, in between here, maybe put a bigger plant in here. This will be a functional form. So when you have a tank, you're really doing architecture and art, and then bring in the water parameters, it's a whole other thing too, and the fish species and all that. But getting it down, if I can have this not turn into an algae fest, which will be the next challenge, um, the plan is to hide these intersections so it looks more like a natural mountain. Like, I want this piece, this piece to show. I don't want any of this showing right in here. But I want it still accessible to shrimp and small fish so they can hide. And uh, back in the back, another trick will be to only be using very small leafed plants. Um... Vi, it's good to have you uh, listening. So, yeah, that is kind of some of the stuff that I wanted to touch on today. Um, I was going to say, too, what else did I have to show you guys over here? Oh, I got this plant, and I don't think it's a true aquatic plant, and I don't know the name of it. Oh, wait, yes, I do. Just saw this. But I got it ah, at Petco. And it was really cheap. It was like two ninety nine or something. But uh, Hemographis species. That's nice. It doesn't tell me what. But it almost looks like a, a red cabbage or something. I don't know. I'm guessing it's not a true aquatic plant. But we'll find out. I'll probably immerse some and 
not immerse others. But this tray works well, so I'll be laying everything out on here. Uh, I just like to point out that, like, this says uh, Myriophyllum species Guiana. And then you look that up online, milfoil. <laughs> but whatever, that's okay. And uh, these are the rocks I'll be gluing things to. They don't necessarily match color, so I'm hoping to use these flakes for the moss and then kind of sticking them into places. Uh, I, I wish that tissue cultures would stay the size that they are, but they don't always do that. But if you live around here or any shop like Aquarium Zen that has tissue cultures, they only live so long looking good and then they start to deteriorate. And so you can get really good bargains sometimes if you go in when, when they've ordered too many and whatnot. Um, I was gonna show you this little project. So all my fish that are dying, which is just cribs, um, I've been putting into this bowl here. And so this bowl has all the nitrates, ammonia, carbon, proteins, amino acids, ATP, you name it, the stuff that life is made of, plus filter floss that is old and full of uh, detritus, and then water. And I've been growing uh, plants out of it, and I hope to sprout quite a bit of stuff for my, um, my tanks and use that energy of the, the fish that passed on. And that way it's not all in vain, their energy, so to speak. Um, it does not smell funky. I thought it was going to also, but no, it doesn't. Also here, so the same mountain range that I collect that jadeite from, here's another example of where I get actual, uh, sorry if it's windy sounding, but I get leaf fossils as well as, uh, sometimes they're small animals but it, it was a marshy area, but you can see here the iron deposit oxidized. And then beyond that, you actually get these, well, spiders on it apparently, but you get these lines where there were wood or twigs and that's actually turned into graphite and carbon. And so that's stuff that affects your tank's pH. And so I just want to make folks aware that if you're gonna use fossils, make sure it's either a very hard fossil or, you know how it's going to interplay. Put it in a bucket, let it uh, let it soak with. I mean, honestly, a filter running is the best thing, and uh, just let it do its thing. So that's kind of the stuff I wanted to touch on. Um, I'm fading fast again here. I'll have to take a break in between things. But are there any questions from anyone? Does anyone like this? time and place um i want to get to bentley uh his place he is an awesome dude we did an aquascaping thing together he's in my fish club and uh just a cool dude ah perfect i found a fibonacci spiral that's, that's what i was looking for perfect example of so here we have the best way to pack in leaves that nature could find. And that's why you see this repeat in different species. Sunflowers is a whole different species of succulents. Um, but you see certain things in life. Let's talk about this. So the guy who pledged $500, I thought for sure that was a... Oh, are we connected? Sorry, I think it got mad that I left. Um... Come on. I'll take a couple of your mother hens. Yeah, uh, I just walk around Ballard and ask people if I can take a clipping, and they're like, sure. Uh, I'm going outside just because my face feels really hot, uh, part of the issue. So you guys can just, we'll, we'll do a little bit of chit-chatting, but you guys can just look at the beauty that is nature and my neighborhood and the mountains over there. Uh, and rent that I can't afford anymore. Uh, but basically that $500, let me, <laughs> let me talk about that. So he gave me the Patreon payment. Patreon basically takes a chunk out of it. So then it was like $428 or something like that between 
some handling fee or something else. And I was like, okay, that's fine, that's fair. But then it said, don't forget that you will tax this, this is a supplemental income. So then you have a 30% tax on that and they report you in Patreon via your social security number to the IRS. And they write you out a 1099 form at the end of the year if you've surpassed $600, which with his $500 donation, I would. So they use that number donated. So he said, I want it to be a real donation. And I was very surprised that he was, so this was the next morning and he messaged me back. Cause I thought for sure the guy was drunk or playing an April Fool's joke, but he wasn't. He was just a really nice guy and he's an, a mechanic and I don't know if he was working maybe natural gas or something, but he's out in North Dakota <clears throat> um, and sounds like kind of the middle of uh, nowhere compared to the big cities. I don't, I don't know. Anything in North Dakota to me is small, but he just really enjoys the channel. And so I asked him, what do you want me to do with this? Like, what would you like to see? And he said, I don't have any, uh, I am not smoking a cigarette. Um, I don't have any uh, wishes of what you should do with it. Um, just, you know, make good use of it. Buy, buy some cool plants and a, a new tank or whatever. And so, basically, I... Uh, <laughs> yeah. And so, he sent me... He, I, I declined his uh, Patreon donation and then he sends it through paypal because I, I talked to him and i was like dude this thing is going to get taxed to the point where i only have 340 dollars left off of it when i get a big chunk like that in a payment they keep track of that and so he i i, I said i'd rather that you pay me through PayPal. Also because the Patreon, it would have thrown off all the stats on everybody who's contributing a dollar or whatever. And I was just like, dude, I will give you whatever you want. This is beyond that. Um, whatever. So it turns out that when you give a gift, you're supposed to pay the taxes on it, which is weird to me. But if you earn money for a specific job, then you are then you're like the person who does the job is supposed to pay the tax so now this he said is a gift and so it's on him and i don't care i'm not gonna track but he paid me through paypal and so it was a gift and so the tax piece is on him and then that way i got to use most of it it can still get uh if i put it in the bank or anything it, it since this has to do with my art business, all my aquarium stuff that I'm doing on YouTube, in theory, uh, there's still a 28% tax rate that you have to be aware of. But um, for the most part, I'm not going to sweat it because I don't foresee this happening ever again. So, uh, yeah, so I got a CO2 tank. I got the CO2 regulator. I got um, more substrate and gave it to you through what about if he gave it to you through friends and family um yeah that would have been i mean it doesn't matter if it's friends or family unless it's first like mom and dad or brother and sister um it just doesn't matter uh let me go back to fish i guess i don't know um i was just getting hot inside it the tanks have been making me feel hot with the inflammation on my face um but yeah, so it doesn't really matter. It's just a technicality. And like, I doubt they'd ever call it, uh, you out on it for taxes. But just in case, you know, I don't, I have a business that I run with my graphic design. And at the end of the year, I didn't want some crazy bill for like all the YouTube stuff. Because they tax the YouTube stuff 30% too. And I don't have any, right now I'm not making any money off of YouTube. So if there's ads, I'm sorry because I'm, I'm not getting money off of them. YouTube's the only one getting money off of them right now. Um, even though I passed that, the, that benchmark and it's supposed to open up features like super chats and things like that. I think that might be a higher 10,000 mark or something. But regardless, um, you can't actually call like, 
tech support or do a whole bunch of weird things until you hit different bench stones and earmarks on YouTube. So it's kind of a funky system I'm still learning. But I'm very appreciative of everyone. And the other thing I said is I want to give back. So I'm definitely sending him uh, whatever the hell he wants from my tanks. But I'm also going to be giving uh, y'all some things. And I talked with him for a while, and he said, why don't you invest in the money up front to get your fish room up and going instead of having your five tanks upstairs have your seven downstairs and then your other upstairs tanks why don't you turn some of those downstairs tanks with the money into um like a hatchery for the leopard endlers like why don't you start getting a good amount and then anybody who's willing to pay shipping in your who's you know on your chats frequently or in your um patreon page or subscribers you could send endlers this next round like there's some now that are going out but really a hundred bucks i can only send like five or six people fish with the amount of packing supplies and shipping like it's not very good returns but if people want to pay the shipping and if i use that money to expand then people just pay a little bit and i can put a whole what's up sergeant tanks man how's it going dude um and if 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 people want to pay a little bit then i can get a whole lot more people fish and so that was kind of his suggestion and i thought that was a good suggestion but the other stuff is all you're seeing it manifest over time like you're seeing like a heater broke i i bought a heater um i have that new aquascape so clearly this aquascape over here has some the co2 and the regulator plus um the ada soil which i got sponsored luckily which was really cool but that's all uh you know the the plants that are in here other than me dumpster diving uh and getting cuttings from people that money is going towards that a little bit like my own money and that money um so yeah, there's just uh, little things like that where the money's going to, and then I'm saving a chunk for taxes just in case I'm wrong and something goes off. And then there's another over 100. Uh, Laura with an O. That's like my wife. Um, <clears throat> in any case, uh, then there's another 100 that I can put towards the free shipping when I said I was going to send people endlers. I haven't forgotten. The little leopard endlers are just taking forever to grow their tails out and um, get up to size. Like, it's been three and a half or four months, and usually they're quicker than that. But now that I have a power head down in the tank, the 20-gallon downstairs, and it's just endlers in that tank, <clears throat> we should be able to grow them out a lot faster since they'll be getting exercise and an auto feeder and stuff like that. So, all that is gravy. We talked about the aquascaping stuff. I'm going to be using <clears throat> more of this little um, pennywort that grows and then more of this uh, fine-leafed uh, milfoil. Basically, it's in the same family. And then also, I really like uh, peninsfada. And so I think that might be what's destined to hide this seam. And then the shrimp could still crawl through that and into there. But the thing is, I'll need to come up with like a little mini pot or like fence this off, like hot glue something in there and uh, put uh, aqua soil so that the panitifada will, will grow or reek tab. Uh, let's see here. We've got a message. I've been really enjoying watching your videos the past few weeks. Thank you for your great advice. I've just aquascaped my brand new Fluval Flex 57. All right, awesome. Well, thank you for watching. I appreciate it. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, so totally. And uh, Kazmary K says, oh, wow, I'd like to thank your benefactor as well. Yeah, so exactly. So I want to give back to you guys for being a part of the community. I'm going to give people on Patreon like more random draws out of the hat when I do that. The other thing is I'm supposed to be teaming up with Flip Aquatics. He's expanding like crazy and it's really expensive and stuff for him to do that. And it's taken up a lot of his time and I know I'm not his priority. 
but he keeps saying he will send me shrimp. So when he gets shrimp, the other plan is to have Caradina, Neocaradian, Neocaradina, Neocaradina hatcheries going on <clears throat> with rock hides and things like that. So I'll have Neocaradina Neo different types in every tank. And I'd also like to send those out or plants out. Now, this is the tank. This stuff was planted and it's growing better, ironically, in this tank than it is upstairs. But this is also growing up. That little delicate plant there is the same plant as this. It's Glosso. Um, so, and same as here. So I'll have to hack this dumpster dive <laughs> style and then uh, before it dies back, replant that and hopefully it makes it. Um, but yeah, the other thing that I have to do that's a bummer today is um, I want to get new ones and I'm going to talk to the wet spot about sending them, but she passed away last night. She's in a bag sealed and she's my Lukunja crib. Don't know what went wrong with her. She was just sluggish for a day or two and staring off into space rather than flirting and running around with her boo. And uh, I'm going to, I know it's kind of gross, but I've got a microscope and I'm going to cut her open to make sure there's no worms. I'm going to check out her gills, her scales, and just try to figure out what the heck is going on that's killed four cribs now. And they're just the wild caught ones. Everyone else is fine. Also, I wanted to point out that uh, there's more of that uh, penny wart that will be in the other tank um, growing out. Um, and more of the glosso so it just needs lots of trimming the tank upstairs is going to be a pain in the butt to take care of but it'll be my really manicured one also i'm growing out uh if you can see them these ultra bright orange pink and red uh ram's horn snails with uh me metallic gold silver or clear shells like uh, translucent -y, opalescent shells and so right now there are root tabs in this tank and this tank. I think there's six. I think I did like one, two, three, and then I staggered the next ones back. And uh, But they're, they're growing really well because these tanks are still partially cycling. I used water from the tanks upstairs, and I filled them 50 to 75% with that water, and then I used the filter medium from like the filter floss from other tanks and then I put new sponge filters. So I bought both these sponge filters with that 500 too. Got consistent heater so I can hopefully breed the cribs. And then up here, we have killifish uh, eggs, uh, the annulus clown killifish, um, which let's see, we'll find you one. Also, we've still got some bluegrass uh, guppies around here. They're in the big 40 gallon tank too. And I don't know if it'll, fl yeah, you can see the blue for a sec there. So we'll see how they turn out, but right now, I, I guess they're half Endler, half Guppy, but we'll see what happens. I've kind of got a couple strains going, and these guys are the ones I'm growing out for y'all, and depending on how good a quality they are, I finally got rid of the black spot. See the black spot that's on that one? I got rid of it. In this line, there's emerald green like I wanted it. Bob, hey, welcome. I probably calling it quits sooner than later but uh thank you so much for joining i was just pointing out that we got rid of the black i mean some people like it and so i'll keep a tank with the black but i want that emerald green a little bit of black's fine but i want that emerald green and then i also want blue on a spade tail so we're getting there with these endlers and they're coloring up and I'm going to have to separate so only like the two males that have the green. Uh, and there's a killifish here. So here is a clown killy or an annulus killy. Here's a male and a female next to each other. You can see the male has the orange and the red. Female has a bigger belly and she has a gold line up her back uh, if you look at it in the right light. But up here I've had a bunch of killies and a whole bunch of um, hornwort and then floating stuff and not really much light in here. And basically they laid eggs and then they ate a bunch of the eggs. And so I pulled them out and it's like a three to four week gestation period for them. And we'll see, there's a few snails lurking. I didn't think there were any, 
but clearly there there was this one and I see a few others. Uh, hornwort is hard to get free of snails once it has them. But hopefully, I've been putting vinegar eels and micro, like white micro um, worms in here. Hopefully, uh, those will hatch eventually. I don't know. We'll see what happens. I'll give it another week. And if nothing happens, I'll put the killies back up there and try one more time. But when Rob sends the shrimp, then we'll have a whole other thing going on. I have a Fluval Flex. What is it? A V5 gallon? I don't know. It's all, it's pretty grungy right now. I'm going to need to work on it. Um, and this stuff's all rusted out, but I'll figure it out. That was also a kind, uh, we did a trade of the tank. I won the aquascaping tank that I got the good deal on that I won. Um, and yeah, so traded that around this got for 50 bucks also, and it's full of CO2. So that's rad. Um, and uh, that will be able to run this whole rack, if not more. The, all this, I still need input. I'm looking online. I want to get one of those power strips that turns out because these things screw everything up, like the big plugs. And there's so many things plugged in that I want surge protectors, but I also want like the breaker protector and um, yeah. So between all these things, it's just a fire hazard. It looks like crap. And I need to look at some well-done fish rooms to figure it out because there's not really a place to hide it. And then also the last thing, as I've said before, is into the stud on the wall need to be uh, attaching something for earthquakes because we are in a very earthquake-prone area here in Seattle. So, all right, guys. Well, thank you so much for joining. As always, um, I am worn out again. Uh, oh, YouTube, stop.